My humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piran Sankaran, Guru Piran Nyo, fellow Nyanis. Today I'm going to be speaking about Mahan's I Got philosophy, but today I'm going to explore the mind of a Mahan. How did Mahan come to this realization and also um, the discovery of the I Got philosophy and this Kundalini meditation method? Uh, here I'm going to talk about how Mahan's exploration stage, um, you know, the type of questions that he had, the queries that he had, and what is it that shaped his mind to become a universal personality. So I'm going to start with uh, the kind of questions that Mahan had in his mind in his early stage of his exploration in this spiritual pursuit. Uh, if you read Mahan's I God book, you'll see that there are many questions that he had uh, as he was, you know, traversing this journey, trying to discover who he was and discover what this universe about, this universe is about, and also this concept of God, a better understanding of the concept of God. Mahan, like many other explorers, was searching for many answers to many questions. And, and what is really interesting is that he continuously, relentlessly was searching for these answers uh, when ordinary people would have this, some of them would have these questions, but oftentimes get distracted. But this Mahan, you know, pursued it with intensity and persistence. And over time, he was able to discover many secrets. And that's the journey that I want to talk about, this the kind of workings of a mind of a Mahan. What is it that we can learn from this, you know, and, and how do we shape our own mind? Mahan, when he was in his early stages of his uh, uh, spiritual pursuit, he had many questions. And the three questions that came up in his mind was this notion of, you know, hunger. He was thirsting for this knowledge. And he says that, you know, this thirst is similar to all the other thirsts of life. Uh, but many of the thirsts of life, it is easy to find the fulfillment. And here he identifies three important hunger. In Tamil, he used to say, Kudal pasi, udal pasi, ullatin pasi. What that means is that the hunger for food, this is a, a, an important, as food is an important aspect of our own physiology and on our own biological life. Then the second uh, hunger is a hunger for conjugal relationship. I'll explain the two in more detail. And the third one is the hunger to know who we are and why we are here. The, let me come back to the first question. The hunger for food is part of the survival of the body. The body needs energy. The body needs nutrient. And as the body uses up energy and as the energy starts depleting, uh, there is something that triggers within our body that says, look, the body is, needs more energy and, you know, pangs of hunger is there so that we go in search for food to fulfill that need. So it's part of nature's way of ensuring the survival of the body. And this is part of the instinct that is built in every biological being to survive through this whole process, this journey called life. And hunger for food is one of those instincts. So how do we resolve this? Well, it's the search for food, you know, and once the food is, um, you know, uh, uh, once, you know, as humans, we eat the food or drink, you know, the necessary uh, nutrients, we see that our energy level goes up and then we're able to function in the same way for all the other biological beings. So we see that the hunger for food could be easily be quenched, you know, by consuming food and water and nutrient. The second type of um, hunger that Swamiji talks about is conjugal relationships. And this is an integral part of our own uh, biology. It's, it's built into our DNA that part of our uh, physiology is to ensure the survival of the species, which means that we pass on our DNA to the next generation and the next generation. And we've been here for thousands of years. And through these relationships, we're able to pass on our own information and our own, you know, our species is able to continue its journey over time. 
And we see that it is also a part of the instinct of nature that is inbuilt in every biology, including ourselves, the homo sapiens. So we see that this conjugal relationship to be able to meet, uh, to be able to meet that needs, oftentimes we have partners, right? Through marriage or through relationships that we are able to then you know, um, exchange information, knowledge, and also our DNA so that the next generation is able to continue. And oftentimes, you know, uh, these relationships are critical in the human species. Normally, people will get into an institution of marriage to ensure that, you know, the next generation has a stable home, stable place, and stable, uh, you know, environment for them to thrive. But again, we see that this hunger could be met through, you know, the, the through partnership and through union, and and again, Swamiji says it is part of uh, the instinct of nature. The third hunger he speaks about is the hunger that all of us, after we meet the needs of, you know, acquisition of food, and and the relationships, you know, we see that, you know, we have we start wanting much more deeper things in life. And particularly, you know, the search for who we are, what we are made out of, and why are we here? So these are questions, burning questions that many seekers, many explorers, many scientists that ask this question. Oftentimes, you know, um, most ordinary people, it would have passed through their mind, you know, who are we, what are we, and why are we here? And oftentimes we don't pursue it because we get distracted by other things in our lives. But Mahans and intensive explorers and scientists tend to pursue this with relentlessly searching for the answers of who are we? Why are we here? What are we made out of? And this is what we saw in the context of Mahan, that at the age of 11 years old, he started asking this question. And he pursued this intensively it was constantly in his mind, you know, it, it, you know, bothered him that he couldn't find the answer. He asked many, many people these questions. He was not satisfied. He had his own exploration. He, he you know, read a lot of religious teachings. He did a lot of the, you know, prayers and the, you know, many, many things to to discover this this truth. And he says that this is. This hunger is not as easy as the first two, because the search for oneself, the answer is not very clear, and the answer is not very straightforward. One cannot obtain this from that object world. Like food, we can acquire that food, you know, similarly relationship. But to acquire this knowledge of this, you know, where we come from, what are we made out of, requires a lot more intensity. It's not very clear. Of course, there are many scriptures that give ideas and gives, you know, uh, ways to acquire this. But this acquisition is not as easy as as what is written. So Swamiji pursued this intensively, and he had many, many questions in his mind, you know. And he kept asking many people these questions. He, you know, looked at many, many teachings and philosophies and started exploring uh, this these questions. One of the things that is really interesting uh, in Swamiji's context is that he looked at many things around him and he realized that scientists, when they want to find something and they know that, you know, the eyes may not be able to see things and there are still, you know, microbes and things that are, you know, beyond the, the, the realm of the eye. But yet, you know, scientists are able to develop microscope and electron microscope to look at the most minutest things. There's an entire cosmos that, that governs this micro level uh, universes and scientists use microscope. The same thing with respect to the grand universe out there from the Big Bang to the quasars to the galaxies in distant you know, space. So what scientists try to do is that they use telescopes <clears throat> to be able to pick up the most faintest uh, light and try to you know, understand the, the forces that governs this you know, uh, universe around them, you know, the, the, the galaxies. So both the microscope and the telescope emerge from the human mind. 
So Swamiji was of the view that these are object related, these are external, but for me to discover, you know, God or, or the idea of the creator, then a part of the creator must be embedded in me. Because if God is infinity, you know, and infinite, a, you know, is there a place God is not? If, if there is a place God is not, then it cannot be a wholesome God who is infinite. So God must be embedded within me. And this is where he says, like scientists using telescope and microscope, he says there must be, you know, various parts of, there, are, there may, must be things within me that enable me to discover this. And this is where he discovered that inner scope intensively. You know, that, that within him, there are important components that will lead him to this discovery of the self or God or some the creator itself. So he realized this and he started pursuing this intensively. And he had many, many questions as he was exploring on that meditational front, the, the, the yoga front, the Kundalini yoga front, you know, moving from external to internal, he had many, many questions. He thought he'd be able to find the answer, but he got more questions. And, and many of the questions, you know, were that, you know, if God is formless, you know, how is it that we have form? You know, shouldn't we also be formless? You know, how is it that everything I'm seeing is of form? He had this question, you know. And he read a lot that God is that's got no form, no color, no dimension. As he intensified this meditation, he had more queries and questions, you know. If God has got no form, why is it that I have form? Everything I'm seeing is of form. You know, he says, where does this form come from? You know, we have form, but to be able to see the formless God, how do I do it? Right? So he's asking this question, if God is subjective, right? Not an object, then how do I use my object body to discover the subject? So he had this question in his mind. He went on to, you know, have more intensive questions, more deeper questions. If God created us all, then what created God? So there must be something that created God. And he asked, what is this creative substance, right, that make God and me, right? So he started probing, what is this, this substratum or the substance that created all this? Then he went on to pursue that, you know, this whole notion, if God is all full and wholesome, then if God is everywhere, then what is the need to search for God in a particular place to worship him? If God is everywhere, shouldn't that be, you know, his place be everywhere and not in a particular place? So you see that Mahan's thinking became very deep. He was asking about this creator. He was in this intensive search for this designer and the creator of our universe. And he went on to ask more questions. He says the more he tried to, you know, uh, resolve these questions, you know, more questions started coming in. So then he went on to ask this question, you know, when God is one, you know, then why is there multiple names for this one God? And here he's touching on the element of Advaita, uh, without knowing in the sense that, you know, Often we say that it is Advaita teaches, you know, there is only one, not two. So he says, if, if the scriptures are saying that God is one, then why do we have multiple names, you know, multiple forms, right? Then he went on to ask this question, if God is very big, you know, wholesome, why do we see differences, you know? Why am I cognizing differences, you know? There are powerful things, there are weak things, he also go questions this this notion of judgment day. He says that, you know, that if there is a judgment day, why do we have so many you know uh, laws and things around us? You know, uh, if it is if there is judgment in this material, does that judgment still hold in 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 the next world? Then he asks this question on you know evil, good and evil. He asks this question that you know if there is 
characterization of evil and good, which of this is the bigger one? So again, coming back to this notion of difference, you know, he's able to, he's starting to ask, if everything is one, why do we have good and bad? Why do we have big and small? Shouldn't all be the same? Right. So here again, Swamiji is now starting to look at the characteristics of God, trying to understand this characteristic of God. One hand, we say it's wholesome, full, infinite. And then we see a counter examples to all that. We see differences, small, big, evil, and so on. So he says, how do we reconcile these differences? This is in the early stage of Mahan's exploration, you know, and he was searching for many, many questions. He had a lot of queries. The more he probed into one question, there were multiple questions that were coming in. In the same way, he, he brings this notion of uh, paradise and hell. He says that, you know, how come, you know, that uh, we enjoy the fruit of, uh, you know, uh, heaven and hell and this notion of next birth? If everybody is migrating to heaven and hell, why is the population growing? So where are they coming from? Right? So there must be somewhere that people are coming from. If everybody goes to heaven and hell, and there are no other places, then the population should start declining. So he's asking very pragmatic questions. And the next question he asks is, is about the question on you know, illusion. He says, if, if God is truth and unchanging, and we are part of it, then why do we have changing realm? Why do we have that illusion? You know? Why not just, you know, the unchanging substratum? So again, we see that, you know, this duality of real and illusion. So Swamiji is trying to understand this, this, what is really real and what is unreal. So again, we see that his thinking is going deeper and deeper. As he was opening, as he was probing one question, more questions emerge. So, you know, this whole notion of duality started coming in. It says that if everything is one, how is this duality appearing? So what is really real? Then he went on to ask this question, you know, that if man's creation is considered the greatest, and you know, often we say the man is the most, um, you know, intelligent, the greatest of all the species, then he asked this question that if man is the greatest species, then how is it that man is dependent on other creatures? You know, uh, if man is the greatest, then how is it that there are other creatures that are more truthful than man? So he's asking this whole idea that man is the most highest evolved species. So again, you know, what is it that makes them great? So thinking about the qualities of humans and their lives. And that probes that probe leads him to more deeper question. He says that, you know, this whole idea that man is great and he will live forever. But there was nobody that lived forever. You know, he says that, you know, there is death. So is there anyone that has lived, you know, up to this state without death? So he's asking this notion of what dies and what does not die. Is he so again, uh, you know, he's he's got this idea that, you know, that there are, you know, notions that says about eternal life, man does not die. But yet we see, you know, uh, death is a key element or key part of life. So how do one reconcile this eternal life and the transitory life that has got birth, sustenance for a short while and death? Right. And then he goes on to ask, who is the greatest? So what is it that is the greatest? You know, if God is the greatest and a DNA of him is with us, where is this greatness? What is it that is great? Is it imprinted in us? And if God is the most supreme bliss, he says, what is this? You know, is it something that is inbuilt in us? Why is it that we don't experience this supreme bliss? You know? So again, he had this 15 odd questions in him and he's, you know, he's asking this notion of all this, this you know, wonderful characteristics that God has. And he says that if we are part of God, the DNA of that must be with us. How is it that we don't experience this greatness? I think so again, uh, he had many, many questions. Say, how can I discover this? You know, many scriptures talked about it, but I can't find a way to 
access this information, experience this. And for Swamiji, the experience is really important. He says, but I don't know, I, I know this idea is, you know, it's theoretically excellent, you know, great, but I want to be able to experience this. I want to translate this theory into experience. Only then I'll know whether if it's true or not. So this Mahan wanted to transform this theology into something that he can experience. So he pursued these answers to these questions relentlessly. Most ordinary persons would think about it, yes, for a few seconds, and then they get distracted and, and move on to doing other things. You know, what's my next meal or, you know, what's my next job or who should I be looking at and all those things. But this Mahan was amazing. He pursued this intensively from the age of 11 right up to at the age of 38 when he met an elderly person that saw him searching for these questions intensively and you know always in the state of introspection contemplation reflection was trying different different meditational method and this elderly person on the 7th of january 1938 showed him a simple technique that instead of searching outside out to search for this divine vibration within himself and the moment he got that he started intensifying he held on to it he started intensifying his search even more so he gave up his worldly life his job in search for answers to this question so what did he do he acquired this vibration he acquired this knowledge of there is something within me. This elderly person showed him how to focus his mind. And what Swamiji did was that he took this knowledge and he started researching and intensifying even further. And he, over time, was able to discover this vibration. He was able to focus, you know, slowly decouple from the vibration, from external vibration to that internal vibration and he started intensifying and through this intensity intensified tapas he was able to discover three four internal eyes what she calls the inner scope the forehead eye that enabled him to concentrate and be aware the base eye that strengthens the body gave the body energy that intensified the electromagnetic field and uh, he was also able to, to intensify the vibration at the nape eye, which enabled him to you know, build strong memory bank. Whatever he learned and he experienced, he's able to deepen it and store it. And in that process of awareness, he was also able to unlock all the memories and you know, things were stored by nature in our own biology. And slowly, slowly that started opening up those treasure vault was starting to open up and reveal important secrets. And as he started intensifying this meditation, both, you know, through his forehead eye, base eye, nape eye, he was able to move that force to that crest eye, where there's a sense of calmness, coolness, a sense of universal experience. The frequency started dropping. The frequency of this material world started slowly subsiding was able to acquire the state of quietude. In the state of quietude, his bandwidth, neural bandwidth, expanded and deepened. The awareness became more intensive. The, the memory bank became more richer with knowledge, not only the knowledge that he was acquiring and being aware, the knowledge of nature and the universe started revealing things to him. And over time, the interplay between the four eyes strengthen his body, you know, enrich his mind, build strong neural networks, deep neural networks, brought a sense of calm and quietude, and started opening up the vault of the secrets of this universe. As he started intensifying this knowledge, he started discovering something very important. He started discovering his own spiritual compass, all the things that he studied, all the things that he was uh, revealed to from the scriptures made sense. 
you know, all the questions that he had on God and the creator were slowly becoming more and more clearer. And what was discussed and what was thought about of God external was slowly starting to converge. And the convergence was starting to take place as he was starting to get an experiential wisdom knowledge that was starting to reveal that as this universe and as God, which is an in infinite form, is part and parcel, uh, part and parcel of this universe and the creator of the universe. It is also embedded in all of us. And as he started understanding this in, from this knowledge, and also um, as he was starting to intensify his meditation, the spiritual pursuit gave him that experiential wisdom knowledge. And there was a convergence of that bhakti, the religious knowledge. That gave him very deep philosophical and theological knowledge started converging to his experiential knowledge and it, it all became one and there is a passage that he says very clearly you know what he says there is that all the knowledge that is embedded in the scriptures you know he was able to experience it and that experience gave him you know, that opening up of the important channels which nature's embedded in us that give him that enlightening wisdom, knowledge, and that experience. And to acquire that, he needed to take two important routes. One is a very scientific approach based on evidence, empirical evidence. That means that experiential evidence. So the truth can only be revealed through a scientific lens based on experience. And that is what Swamiji is experiencing. You know, the slow convergence from external to the internal universe through this meditational process. And also, as that convergence was taking place, he was able to then reason it through logic. Why is this happening? How is this happening? When is this happening? So he combined both the scientific pursuit and the rational pursuit through logic. And both became an important, you know, support and enabler for him to bring the convergence of his religious knowledge and its and his experiential knowledge is one. And that gave him a fusion of the discovery of that self. So he pursued this through, you know, this discovery through meditation, through a scientific lens, through introspection, contemplation, reflection, and intensification of his tapas. And both combined that meditation that enabled him to acquire that spiritual compass he intensified and it led him to seven important practices. The meditation reinforced that bearing, that focus, that spiritual compass, and the spiritual compass guided him to stay focused on his meditational pursuit and both reinforced one another. And we saw that you know the, the practice in him intensified, not just in meditation, while he was partaking in this material, he observed everything with a sharp you know, intellect, a quiet mind, observing, absorbing, and integrating and being one with this. That practice of integration, you know, intensification is very important. So what helped him is that the introspection, contemplation, reflection, and that meditation. In that intensive tapas, the understanding of life became much more clearer. The meaning of life became very clear. The purpose of his existence became much more clearer. And interestingly, the whole you know uh, idea of why am I here, all those questions, the answer to those questions became very clear. And he had a zest for living, you know, the wanting to learn more, enriching, you know, enlightening, and living to outlive everything, and that purpose and you know led to that passion of wanting to know more and what is really interesting is that you know as that intensified a sense of patience calmness coolness took place and this is not surprising as he was practicing the the crest eye the sense of quietude was starting to dawn in on him you know he was unperturbed by anything just a silent observer of everything that is happening and he pursued that with intensive, you know, perseverance, you know, steadfast 
while engaging in this material world, ordinary people get distracted. But Swamiji had this, he, he got the spiritual compass that gave him direction. And he pursued this, persevered it, in spite of going through a very challenging, you know, experiences in his life. Giving up his job, living in poverty, being, you know, ridiculed by many people, you know, and a whole range of other challenges that he went through. And he persisted. He says, this is the direction, this is the focus. You know, I'm not going to decouple from this. This is who I am. And as he pursued with persistence, he realized that he is that Parajodhi, you know, that enlightened divine life. God is none other than part and parcel of me, a manifestation of me. So it's a gradual exploration of that, having a lot of questions and queries and not being perturbed by it or distracted by it, you know, developing strategies to search for this answer, you know, by observing outside and more importantly, observing inside, you know, and, and making that pilgrimage from external to internal to be able to discover the DNA of that creator, DNA of the universe within oneself. And Mahan was able to do that. He was able to discover the spiritual compass in that process. He was able to attain that Parajodhi mindset, a wow mindset. So we see that he documents this experience. He says that, you know, when he was going through the early phase, he had a lot of questions. You know, so numerous questions arose in me by themselves and believing them all in my state of analyzing them. So he started, the more questions he had, you know, one question led to more, and he started intensifying his meditation. He says, I continue to exert in Kundalini tapas. This inner eye was his spiritual compass. He says, as a result of the tapas, answers got for all the questions. He got the answers. He published them in small, small booklets, you know, so that, you know, not just theological or theoretical, the journey that he experienced, the experiential knowledge, to, he documented it so that others too can follow and try to experience this inner journey that led to the discovery of that self and that creator of this universe. So he says, at last, it creates itself. It enjoys itself. It ends itself. So we are all manifestation of God. He says that, you know, uh, the difficulties that, that arose, he says, you know, all the questions and the queries are of our own making because we are in a state of ignorance. We are in a state of conflict. We are in a state of, you know, uh, disharmony. He says, the moment we learn to get harmony, the, the moment we become more consistent and conscious, we see that all these queries and challenges, you know, disappear very similar to the dew on the grass or the leaf. You know, we see that in the morning, but as the sun comes up, you know, it all evaporates. In that same way, all our queries, questions, the answers emerge. Our ignorance evaporates as our enlightenment starts dawning upon us. And he says that this, the outcome of all this journey, you know, of the self-discoveries is incorporated in the book called I, God. So Swamiji's journey was a remarkable uh, journey. How he had at a very early age, 11 years old, you know, searching for this answer. He kept intensifying, you know, until the age of 38 when he was shown a way to transition from outside an external pilgrimage to an internal pilgrimage. And he intensified that meditation he intensified his introspection, contemplation, reflection. He had many deep questions. He pursued the answers to those questions as he intensified his meditation and got his spiritual compass. He was able to slowly discover the answers to those questions. And as he discovered the answers to the question, he became more and more enlightened. And there came a point, he says, that everything manifests, starts with me, sustains in me, and dissolves in me. And this is the philosophy of the I God philosophy that Mahan discovered. And the exploration of the mind of a Mahan tells us that, you know, for all of us to attain an enlightened life, we need to be pursuing that intensive practice, introspection, contemplation, reflection. You know, we need to 
have a purpose and meaning of our lives. You know, search for that meaning and seek for that meaning and discover the meaning in life. And as we discover the meaning in life, we have the zest for living, you know, a zest for understanding, a zest, zest for being enlightening, enriching and outliving all our experiences, you know, cultivating patience, not rush into doing things, taking the time to learn, experience, devoting time and persevering and, and having that persistence. Yes, time, sometimes we get distracted. We get to always bring back, allocate time for ourselves, you know. And finally, if we did all that, we would attain that Mahan-like quality, that Paranjodi quality, that illuminator does not come from outside. It comes from within all of us. And that's what a Mahan is. A Mahan is someone who is a grand, wholesome, universal mindset that is able to understand, integrate, and live in a universal way. So with that, Sandosham, I hope all of you all will look at the example of Mahan and follow his footsteps, and you'll see that your life will become more blissful, more enlightening, more you know, inspirational and, and an awesome journey. Every moment becomes an enlightening moment. With that, I hope that today's lecture gives you a little bit more insights into the mind of this Mahan and it enables you to discover the Mahan in you. Sandosham.